Hello, this is the second of my videos on Alastair Parker's The Second World War, A Short History. Uh, this is from the first chapter on his, his Hitler, Germany and the origins of the European war. It's, it's setting the background uh, in terms of political developments before the start of the war itself. So we've just in the, the last week talked about Hitler's rise to power in Germany. We'll now move on to talk about Hitler in power. As I said last week, this is obviously a very complex um, period and this chapter is just a very brief summary. Uh, this is Hitler's uh, 1932 official political portrait. So Hitler in power, establishing control. When Adolf Hitler became chancellor, he successfully insisted on Nazi control of both the Prussian and Reich ministries of the interior and police. He also used an expanded SA, that's the brown-shirted stormtroopers, the Sturmabteilung, his own private militia, to intimidate civilian politicians, whilst offering Hindenburg and the army leadership bribes and flattery, promising the army both expansion and continued independence. Uh, very significantly, in March 1933, he secured the establishing establishment of the Enabling Act, which gave him a legal dictatorship, and he was able to then dissolve other political parties and effectively uh, create a one-party state. In power, Hitler was forced to choose between the SA and existing power holders with their wealth, property, and influence. In 1933 and early 1934, he could bully civil politicians with his militia, his stormtroopers, but he also antagonized groups with social and political links with the army by so doing. Though the SA were his strongest supporters, its leaders and many of its members wanted a radicalization of German society with higher status and employment for themselves, including giving SA officers an equal standing with army officers this unexpectedly, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, antagonized the regular army leadership, which feared it might be swamped. Uh, by the summer of 1934, Hitler had made his decision, and in June, uh, 100, 200 SA leaders were murdered, along with some of Hitler's old uh, political foes, like von Schleicher. This is the so-called Knight of the Long Knives. From 1934 until 1938, there was a period of relative normalization and respectability. Order seemed to have returned. Although there was discrimination against Jews, it was done by legislative prohibition rather than open brutality. Violence against political opponents was hidden behind the fences of the newly established concentration camps. Nazi Germany was now run by two only partly interlocking sets of rulers. On the one hand, the established civil service, the judiciary, teachers, army officers, businessmen, and the police. And on the other, the Nazi party with its own hierarchies and spheres of influence. There was no liking or respect between the two, but only toleration. This dual system meant that the Third Reich was orderly, old-fashioned, conservatively honest and efficient in many areas of life, but with the presence of brutal, lawless, often corrupt, and sometimes incompetent Nazi party mechanisms. Hitler himself was lazy and intellectually coherent. Part of his political dominance was achieved by not making choices between conflicting purposes and methods, but rather arbitrating between them. A wide range of people, Nazi zealots, conservatives and others, could all continue to regard Hitler as their ally. His oratory, oratorial genius made him the only possible Nazi chief, enabling him to act as an absolute ruler, though not in the hard-working manner of Philip II or Napoleon, with their great attention to administrative detail. Rather, Hitler was the ultimate last resort, 
the final adjudicator between conflicting subordinates and overlapping jurisdictions. By 1939 and the start of World War II, support for Hitler had increased further. Initially, the Nazi government merely continued the credit creation schemes of von Papen and von Schleicher, but these were soon extended and the large-scale public work programs were added. Then, from 1934 onwards, rearmament increased, and in 1935, compulsory military service was restored. Thus, by 1936, unemployment had nearly disappeared. This recovery made available the enormous economic resources that had been unused during the Depression, so that by the late 1930s, the whole labor force prospered. Uh, there were greater profits, increased incomes for agricultural producers, and German armament production also now outstripped that of any other country. Although there were no elections or free votes to measure support, it seems likely that by the end of 1938 a substantial majority of Germans had accepted the regime. Hitler could pursue his foreign policy objectives as master of a powerful united country. But what were Hitler's foreign policy objectives before the war began? Important to identify them because clearly if they existed they were the causes of the war. But several serious historians think it's futile to ask. Either Hitler was the product of inevitable social and economic forces according to some or it's hard to fit Hitler's actions into any clear pattern, according to others. In terms of economic forces, the workings of capitalism are held to have, as I say by some, to have inevitably led to the Nazi dictatorship and European war. Certainly, Hitler would not have been able to come to power without the world slump, itself the consequence of the way in which the capitalist economies were organised. In most respects, the Nazi regime was compatible with German business interests. But German business did not require the war. The nationalist foreign policy, followed up to 1939, was a base for stable German economic prosperity. Primary producers in southeastern Europe and South America were ready to meet German economic needs. So too were the industrialized countries, especially uh, Britain. It proved possible to cooperate even with the, United, even with, uh, the uh, Soviet Union in 1939. And if capitalism required the destruction of the Soviet Union, then it was inept to simultaneously take on a war with Britain and eventually the United States at the same time. The objectives of German capitalists would have been much better served by not having World War II. Turning to the idea of a lack of a plan, Hitler's actions do not fit into any clear pattern, and his own justification for his actions and expositions of his purposes are, quote, incoherent and inconsistent. Maybe Hitler and the Nazis were moved by a mindless urge to violence, or that their dominance over Germany, including Hitler's dictatorship, needed the justification of an endless struggle against enemies whose identity was determined by accidental circumstances at any particular moment. Hitler's personal popularity inside Germany largely rested on his theatrical performance as saviour of Germany from dangerous foes. By 1938, new enemies were required. This fits in with the extraordinarily confused and muddled nature of the regime, a kind of quote. As Führer, grand leader, Hitler ran his government through competing individuals and organizations. They were all subordinate to him, and he acted as an evasive arbitrator, interfering with reluctance and avoiding committing himself to any definite view. There were very few discussions of general policy, and these took the form of unrecorded conversations between Hitler and a few trusted intimates. His decisions thus came arbitrarily, without debate, nor deduced from general principles, nor explained as methods of reaching agreed objectives. 
his notorious unwillingness to take decisions and the lack of guiding principles behind them give the impression that his actions were responses to changing circumstances and made only to ensure the survival of the regime. The argument that Hitler needed continuing foreign crises and emergencies can't be conclusively refuted. We don't know what would have happened if he tried to rule without them. In 1939, he could have restricted armaments, won concessions from Poland through peaceful negotiation, and secured trading concessions and foreign loans so as to consolidate Germany's position as the strongest European power. But could he have secured support for his dictatorship under such circumstances? Could he himself have accepted them? It seems more likely that he sincerely believed that he should lead Germany in an inevitable national and racial struggle for existence, and, as it happened, the resulting continuing state of crisis provided justification for the Nazi dictatorship. In Hitler's own writings and recorded private utterances, two themes constantly recur. First, the need to solve the Jewish problem, so-called. Secondly, the need to secure what's described as living space for the Germans. Defeating the Jews, according to Hitler, would guard the racial purity of the Germans. Establishing a living space, according to him, would strengthen them in the struggle of survival, which he believed was taking place between competing races and nations. He didn't have a clear idea how these objectives were to be obtained. His detailed ideas were vague and inconsistent. The war against the Jews had to be fought, but the final solution of mass murder didn't fully emerge until 1941. Living space meant land for the settlement of German peasants and a source of raw materials for German industry. And Hitler advocated armed expansion in the East to create a German-dominated land mass capable of self-sufficiency in war and of supporting a struggle against any eventual national rivals. This usually seemed to mean European Russia. Most historians agree that Hitler's great life objective was the destruction of, destruction of the Soviet Union and German exploit, exploitation of Russian resources. But even here, he was inconsistent. In early 1939, apparently trying to work with Poland against the Soviet Union, but for a few months in 1939-1940, making a seemingly serious attempt to cooperate with the Soviet Union on the basis of agreed spheres of influence and making do with most of Poland as German living space. Certainly Rippentrop, Hitler's foreign minister, was allowed to work on these lines. By the end of 1940, however, Hitler had decided to conquer Russia and to exploit both Russia and Poland for Germany's living space. Struggle was seen as inevitable, and that required military power. Thus, before 1939, Hitler consistently urged an increase in the pace, scope, and scale of German rearmament. He even put his thoughts into writing in August 1936, a rare event after 1933. The German economy, he wrote, must be ready for war in four years' time. But no priorities were ever worked out between the army, the navy, and the air force, nor between civilian and military production, nor was a strategy for expansion devised. As elsewhere, Hitler's aims were sought via a series of improvisations. The attack on Poland in 1939, which began the European war, can be seen as a political and strategic improvisation. So that's all I'm going to say for the moment. Uh, thank you very much for listening and particular thanks to my patrons for their support and encouragement without which these videos would not get made. Uh, you're very welcome to support my channel. Like, comment and share on the videos if you wish. Subscribe if you want to be notified of future videos.
and I'll put the Patreon and PayPal links below if you want to provide practical support. Next week, we'll move on to Britain and British policy in the 1930s. Have a good day.